Greetings, everyone. Uh, are we ready to begin? Yes. All right. So, uh, first question, show of hands, how many of you guys build websites for a living? Yes. All right. Quick show of hands, how many of you enjoy building websites for a living? All right. Quick show of hands, how many of you enjoy the beginning of the project where you get to do whatever you want more than the end of the project where you can't? <laughs> yes. That's what we're here to talk about, all right? So um, I, I chose a cheeky title, Developer Swagger, because I feel like there's that feeling you get at the beginning of a project where you can sit down and in like two, three days, maybe a week, knock out 80% of what you kind of need. And that feels very awesome. That like velocity is something that's precognitively empowering. You just know that that's right and it's powerful and it's good and you're making a difference. And then there's sort of like this I don't know, depending on the project and so forth, there's this sort of decay of speed that happens and, and more and more sort of limitations and structures get imposed on you. And part of that's a function of QA and part of that's a function of more stakeholders coming in and maybe there's a big team and yada, yada, yada. But the point is, you have that beginning of every project and it usually just feels so good, especially if you know, you're using Drupal and you know what you're doing and you're building stuff up and you're installing it and plugging it together. And then you lose that at some point. And I'm going to talk today about ways that we cannot lose that feeling, things we can put in place that let us have that same confidence, that same velocity, that same speed, that same swagger all the way through our projects. Um, I'm also, uh, you know, the, the, the technical term for this is application lifecycle management. Um, and uh, I'll explain a little bit about what that means too. So, who am I? Um, for those of you who I haven't met, hi, my name is Josh. I'm Josh K. I'm uh, I've been doing this for close to 10 years and I love it and, uh, and I love this community and I'm really honored to be able to present. I'm so actually kind of terrified and nervous that so many of you came to see me. Um, so thanks for showing up. Um, professionally, this is my gig now. I do this thing called Pantheon. It's like a Drupal in the cloud, all in one platform, build, launch, run, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to get that pitch, pitch go to the booth. I'm not going to talk about Pantheon except at one point where I'm using it to fake a demo that I couldn't set up last night. And uh, I'm going to talk about what the technologies are that we use to build this sort of thing and how you can use them yourself if you want to, how you can use the same open source tools and build your own application lifecycle management system because I think it's very important knowledge for people to have. So quick enterprise software acronym academy. This whole notion is about there are people out there that buy the technology from us usually. Like we're the developers and like even if we're working inside of an organization rather than at a consultancy, there's still someone else who's the ultimate owner, like the site owner or the project manager or the, the project owner if you're into Scrum or the stakeholder, whatever you want to call it, right? And, and usually there's an administrative kind of capacity within the organization, whether it's your organization or the client organization, and they're going to have to like kind of live with this thing for as long as it's around. And sometimes a website is like a two, three, four, five, maybe even more year commitment. And so they need to know that they have the, the stuff in place to be able to keep it online and keep it running and make the updates when you need to make the updates. And, and this is no joke, right? Like I, I used to do um, a lot of Drupal consulting with, uh, with Chapter 3. And uh, we, we at the, when I first started, we just really like didn't want to have anything to do with this. It was very much like, we'll build you the website, we'll train you to use Drupal, and then go for it. Right? And that was good for us because you know, we, we were able to build our business and we were able to work on a lot of interesting projects and we helped a lot of people and thankfully you know, a lot of this stuff isn't that complicated or, or you, know, it, people can, you can get away with kind of fudging it a little bit here and there. But more and more as the, the, the world begins to adopt Drupal and we begin to, begin to get more serious about best practices, this is less and less something that you can kind of hand wave away. Also, if you happen to run a consultancy or work for a consultancy, being able to deliver on this kind of stuff is like really good business because it keeps your customers around for the long haul which is really important if you're trying to grow, grow this industry. We need to build long-term relationships. So these people are looking at two to five year timelines. They're also thinking about Drupal isn't the only thing they do. Like they can't be Drupal experts because they have to own seven, eight, 20 different pieces of technology. And you know, even if people try to standardize more on the web tier, they're also like dealing with like whatever their CRM database is and blah, blah, blah. They got a lot of stuff on their plate and it's hard. You kind of have to appreciate the fact that a bunch of these people are, are overworked, underpaid, stressed out, and under a lot of pressure, and, and we should be nice to them. Um, I think it's important that this is not just for big corporations and big organizations. This stuff is for everyone. This helps all of us build better sites faster and get them, keep them developing and keeping on going. The, the thing that I dislike the most is when you have a really cool site build process and you get this really great site out the door and then it never 
evolves after that because it's too hard to do the deployment stuff and keep it all in sync and like you have a couple bad experiences where you break the build or whatever and then all of a sudden everybody goes into lockdown mode and you're not able to innovate anymore and that that just kills me right here in my heart so this is for everyone so in the broadest spectrum ALM is like all this soup to nuts it's like you know the guy who's going to do the giant Microsoft project uh, Gantt chart or whatever, and they're going to go from requirements gathering all the way through design, development, project management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to talk about all that. I'm really just going to talk about development, deployment, maintenance, updates, and upgrades, and what are some best practices you can use for these that will help you in doing your job, and what are some tools you can use. So developers want to move fast. As I was saying, it's very gratifying for us to be able to do things quickly. And um, I think there's, you know, there's, there's no coincidence that Facebook chose as their engineering model, we, we like to move fast, because that's very appealing. It gets to that like, powerful early experience. And there's this great old proverb of like, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think that often we are sort of faced with that type of choice, and it's a false choice. I think we can go fast and go together. And in fact, if we really go together as a community, we can go even faster than any of us could alone. Um, you know, we're kind of like this. We're like, we're going to hack it up. We're going to, you know, we've got this glowing thing and a happy mug and we're in the matrix and so on and so forth. And, and uh, the, the, but the, the people sort of who are in charge of that chart or maybe signing the checks or whatever, they're probably a little more risk averse. A, because you have to appreciate that they don't really understand very often what we do. Like the whole Arthur C. Clarke sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Like, have you ever tried to sit down with someone who's uh, like in your family, a normal person, and just explain the internet to them, <laughs> like they're, it's it's as crazy to them. It, like they don't just don't think about it at this point. It's just assumed. Oh yeah, now get online, and the website is there, and they don't really. There's no reason for them to try to comprehend all the little things that have to happen in order to just load a web page on your browser. They just assume that it works and that it's kind of magic. And so when you're in charge of managing a process and you're effectively think you're working with a bunch of magicians who may dress unconventionally and you know go to these cool conferences and you're not quite sure what they're doing, it can make you a little bit uptight, right? So you have people who are afraid of downtime because downtime is money. That's huge for most sites, even small sites. They can't be offline, they can't be down, they can't be broken. Even if like the site is up but the CSS is broken, that's still broken, right? If the user at the end of the day isn't able to load the site in the browser, it might as well, the server might as well be on fire for all they're concerned. Like as a developer, I, I distinguish between these things, but as a site owner, most people don't and nor should they because they're right. And so you get this kind of thing. It's like, yeah, if you could just go ahead and test everything before you deploy it, that'd be great. Um, <laughs> and and, and, and I, I think, you know, I chose the Bill Lumberg meme for this because sometimes when you get this kind of ask, you sort of feel like you are in that Office Space movie, and this guy is kind of a douche. And you're like, man, why? Um, <laughs> but he's right. You should test everything before you deploy it because what you should deploy should be rock solid. And the point is what that process of testing before you deploy should be easy. It should be simple, it should be like powerful, and it should be like all set up for you. That's the right way to do it. So do you have to take risks if you want to move fast? I mean, one way to do it is you can. You know, you can get on a motorcycle, you can leave your helmet behind, you can crank it up and you can just head off down the road. Or you could like get in a sports car with a strap on harness and like have all the equipment you need and you know, drive 100 miles an hour and be you know, relatively safe on a closed course, on a closed course. Um, so no, you don't have to take risks, not if you do it right. And that's what we're going to hear to talk about. It's the success of doing it right. So, swagger. What are the things that cause you to lose your swagger as a developer? Um, I'm going to run through my favorites, and then we can talk about more at the end. Um, there's a, a wonderful poem, um, Two Roads Diverged in a Yellow Wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And that's kind of a nice inspirational poem about being yourself, but in a project, if the two roads diverged, you are so screwed, <laughs> right? Because this is the first thing in, that steals your swagger is like if you are not in sync with the rest of the project, especially after you go live, right? You go live and unless you're in one of these like edgy use cases where there's like no, nothing actually happening on the live side and everything is just pushed out from there. There's a few cases like that, but they're very rare with Drupal because why do people want to use Drupal? Because it's a content management system and you can have people log in and add content and leave comments and fill out forms and so on and so forth. That's the real work of the website and it's happening in live. And if you are not able to stay real close to that and in sync with it while you're developing, you're going to slowly drift apart and then eventually you'll have something like a bug you can't figure out and then I've actually done this right working on a news site spent 
two hours, two hour, two precious hours of my time that I was charging a lot of money for, figuring out that it was just that my database was so out of date that there were no nodes that had been published in the last week, and that's why all the views on the front page were broken, right? <laughs> And those are the sorts of things that happen, and, and like they're unexplained, and it takes a while to figure out. And, and divergence, divergence in content, divergence in code, gets you into tricky situations where you think you've got something solved, and then all of a sudden it breaks, or it doesn't work, or it doesn't behave as expected. And so really, one of the main core goals of the whole continuous integration movement is to minimize divergence. You want to diverge to do your work, and you want to merge back in, and you want to stay close, and you want to stay tight. If, you've got, if you're doing like feature branchy based development and stuff like that, that's really awesome. But if your feature branch is sitting out there for more than a couple days, and you haven't, at least you, ha you don't have to push everything back in, but if you haven't pulled from the master branch or however you have that set up in a few days, you're doing it wrong. You should be pulling like every hour because why wait until the end to deal with the conflicts? You should deal with things immediately and stay closely in sync. Um, divergence leads to fear, leads to nervousness, and, and, and then nervousness leads to like, um, all sorts of things that people think are going to pre prevent them. Like what happens typically in my experience is so there's a bad experience somewhere, something breaks or it doesn't work as expected, and, and then there's a meeting about it, and there's like people are kind of tense because it like you feel like you're on the spot and maybe you didn't do your job right, and you know there's pressure, and then some remediation gets made, and very often the action that is taken out of a kind of a nervous, tense, sometimes in the worst case scenario, finger pointy kind of meeting, the Cures that come from those types of meetings are frequently worse than the diseases themselves, right? Because people are not really thinking about things rationally. They're no longer considering, like, what's the best practice here. They're just trying to have an answer to the problem so that they can say that they did something. And that you can just start to see projects get more and more and more off track and out of scope as these types of decisions are made. Um, I have a friend who is a, a, a wilderness uh, survival expert. And, um, and so he's done things like, you know, rescue people who are drowning in, in lakes and things like that. And, uh, and when you do your wilderness survival training, they teach you that disasters are very frequently like one thing that happened, right? It's the disaster, uh, disastrous events where, where people end up getting hurt or dying aren't usually like, oh, a rock just fell out of the sky and crushed someone. Usually it's like a series of small mistakes that compound into a bigger mistake. And when people are feeling stressed out and under pressure, they're more likely to make these rush decisions and small mistakes that add up to becoming something that's really bad. And then like, you have another bigger meeting that's hopefully a little bit more like, nice and everyone decides to get on the same page. So this all adds up to you not being able to hack, which sucks. Like that's when you know, you've lost your swagger because you're no longer able to hack. I, I think hack is a good word. I like, to, I'm, I'm like, I like to try to reclaim these words like hacking and cowboy and stuff like that because I think it's important to have your swagger. You just got to do it safely, right? So. And, and fear, right? Fear becomes the mind killer. And fear is poisonous. Fear is poisonous inside an organization. It's poisonous inside a software project. It's poisonous inside your personal life. And being able to reduce, eliminate, mitigate, and uh, clear your mind of fear as a developer is really, truly the key to being able to continue to, to move quickly and at a high velocity throughout the life cycle of a project. Um, I think cowboys are cool. Look at Clint Eastwood. How can you deny that? But they are especially cool when they use version control and continuous integration. <laughs> um, so, uh, and one last inspirational quote, learn how to see, realize that everything is connected to everything else, see the big picture, think about that, and then act with wisdom, right? So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to use Git uh, in a way that allows you to perform automated actions after you, you do things. Um, who here is familiar with GitHub? Show of hands? Okay, so basically everybody, because they're totally awesome, um, and they, I'm not going to show you GitHub because uh, you can kind of figure that out on your own. They got documentation, but all the stuff that GitHub does, you can do on your own. And I think it's important to know that. Um, and it works on a hook system, which is a lot like Drupal's hook system. There, there are actions that happen in the process of a Git transaction that then allow you to do other things. So you can pull from a remote really easily. Git has this beautifully distributed version control system that allows you to seamlessly pull from multiple different upstream locations and merge things together. That's like been a game changer over the past three or four years in terms of my work, and I really recommend um, anybody who's not using Git to sort of get with it. Um, but Pushing is a little bit harder. Like if you want to have this workflow that everybody is into now for good reason, like where you get push and then you are deploying, um, 
You can't just push to the remote repo if it's a working copy, because Git will reject that. I, I'll show you it rejecting it in a second. Um, what you need to do is use what's called a bare repo, right? And a bare repository is just a, a different style of checkout in Git that's meant, essentially, to do this type of coordination work between other repositories. So it is actually is not a working tree in and of itself. It's just a pure metadata repository that you can push to and pull from and then very easily trigger actions afterwards. So demo of that real quick. Can you guys, is that visible? Whoa, what if I, what if I do something like, oh, I'm not even on there anymore. No, that's not right. That's it. Okay. Hello, internet. Oh, brutal. This one's there. All right, so what I have here is just a server that I set up. It's a normal uh, uh, virtual machine. It doesn't have anything special fancy on it. I just installed Git and like a couple other very, very basic tools. And so um, where I am in this is in the var git repository. That's where I set up as just a very simple repository. It's got one file in it. Um, that file is available on the internet right here. And it's just a simple index.html file for, for your demonstration purposes. Um, that file actually lives in var dub 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 code. I believe that's where I put it, right? So there's index.html. And um, here I'm in on my I'm like on my uh, my laptop here. Let me actually just move this up so you guys can see it better. Yeah. So I'm here, I'm on, uh, on my local, and uh, I'm just going to show you the not working version where I've uh, checked out a copy of the working repository. Because you can, you can pull from anywhere. You can basically clone from anywhere that you have SSH access to, you can clone from Git. And that's, that's, a, that's a really nice capability because it makes it very easy to share code with other people. But if I want to make some changes here, like if I were to say edit the index.html file with an edit, And commit that, edit that won't work. And if I try to push it, right, like you would with Git, Git's gonna think about it. Ooh. Right? And it's gonna say, no dice. Because uh, the way that it keeps track of changes, if you actually try to push into a working repository, it's going to mess with the hashes and it's telling you that this is unsafe. You can force it to do that if there's ever a reason where you actually absolutely must do this, but it's not recommended. And I like that Git is pretty good about telling you, you know, there's always a force option, but you know, you know you shouldn't usually force it, and that's pretty good. So the trick is you use the bare repository, and that's what I set up in that var git area. And if I go here, and I can make an edit, right? Make a commit. And that's going to go and push through. Do, 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 do. OK. Right, and, uh, and you're gonna see some output here and it says, you know, code deployed, sir. And, um, and if we reload, we're gonna see I've added my change and it's been deployed into that working directory and it's now on the internet. Um, so how did I do that? It's actually quite simple. Um, there is a hook file called post receive that you can use for this. You can also use it to do email updates and all sorts of other things. I'm just showing you how you can use it to deploy code. You can tap into this for all sorts of purposes and there's great documentation in the Git project on this. And uh, because we're all Drupal developers, I went ahead and used PHP as my, uh, my scripting mechanism, but you can use Bash, you can use Python, you can use Ruby, you can use whatever you like here, anything that you can invoke from a shell. And uh, what this is doing is I have a, um, I'm gonna use, this, is, this comes in later. I have a little function to help read like the arguments that are being passed to Git. And I'm basically saying, you know, read the arguments that are passed in, and if I'm pushing to master, right, 
set an environment variable that I need, change the, the directory, and then I'm having it echo the current working path and who am I to be able to, this is while I was trying to debug it last night. And it just does like a little reset hard in case someone, in case somebody ever came in and like edited directly on the, the, the environment that I'm trying to push to with Git, this will squash whatever those changes are because I don't want people to do that. And it's gonna do a checkout of master to make sure that it's on the right branch and then it's gonna pull from master and then it'll say code deployed, sir. And, and this basically gives you the ability to have a, a this is the, you know, the, one of the cornerstones of having a development workflow that allows you to integrate Git very easily with a mechanism that deploys code automatically when things are pushed to master. And that's such a time saver to coordinate a development team. Um, you can, to be honest, like if you're going to do this in production, you can get way, way, way more sophisticated with this. I mean, you can be doing things to check the syntax, you can be doing things to notify people, you can be coordinating uh, other project resources if you want to, but it's all just like a shell script at that point. And you can write that shell script in PHP if you want to. There's no th nothing wrong with doing that. You could be invoking Drush here, other things. Um, so. That's the wrong presentation. So, and, and Git can be used in, in a lot of other ways. I, I, I can't stress enough how wonderful it is when you base your workflow mostly on this technology because it opens up a whole world of possibilities and it can save your butt in so many different ways. Like, uh, uh, as a recommendation, there's a great uh, demo that I saw once and I, I challenge everybody to try this exercise sometimes if you work on a development team because it's actually kind of a fun game. Get an egg timer and set it for like 15 minutes and start writing some code and try to make it so you can make a commit every 15 minutes because the truth is if you're working along a path, unless you're like going down some kind of rabbit hole, you can like sit down, plan out what you're gonna do and be like, okay, step one, first 10 minutes, commit. Okay, reset the egg timer. Second 10 minutes, second 12 minutes, second five minutes, commit, commit. And like uh, this is a really cool exercise and it gets you into this habit of notion of saying, okay, I got something, it's good, I want that in there. And then when you've got something that's holistically working, you push it out and then it gets deployed or you push it out and your colleagues merge it and they check it out and integrate with their work. That type of like frequent commits allow you to easily step back in time and it also kind of enforces a nice discipline as a developer in terms of building in solid steps that you can think about and move forward with. Um, the other thing that's great and I really like to do is to manage my Drupal project and my core updates with Git as well. And so what, this, what, I do, what we do here is in that local working copy, you start by cloning Drupal. Um, and so you get all the project history, which is actually, I'm kind of, I've actually been trying to play around with ways of truncating this because I don't really don't need the project history going back to Drupal like four, but it's all in there for posterity. Um, but you get the whole project history and then you make your modifications, you add your modules, you, you can add a patch to core if you want and do whatever you need to do. And then you push it out to your ro remote bear repository and that deploys it. And then when a Drupal core update comes, your update mechanism is git pull Drupal core git URL um, tag of the release. And unless you've literally like changed a, the same line that WebChick wants to change when we're fixing a bug, it, it'll just merge in seamlessly and you can push it out. And that allows you to not only have a pretty easy and simple update workflow, it allows you to patch core where you need to if you want to get ahead of the project and so on and so forth. It's a, it's a great technique for managing your, your Drupal core updates. Um, so now I want to get in a little bit into this notion of continuous integration, right? And this is the idea, I, what I talked about right there was kind of like how you can push out to a development environment um, and have a bunch of developers work together on that. Continuous integration is how you deal with that when there's also a production environment. And the secret is that you add a third one in the middle called like staging or testing. And the proper workflow that works every time and that I encourage everyone to just accept even though it's not the sexiest thing in the world is you push your code up from dev to test test to live and you pull your database and your content files the opposite direction. Um, when everybody first starts working with Drupal, they are always like, oh, but I could write a script that would just push the right tables in my SQL or I could put the, check the database in and like diff it or something. And it's just not a good idea. It's, you're gonna spend a lot of time working on that and it's gonna be like this brittle duct taped Rube Goldberg kludge machine and eventually it's gonna totally screw you. Um, and so if you just build your, your workflow around this, which is dependable, solid, and reliable, it'll work great. And this is really cool for, all the, the, for doing all the more advanced uh, configuration management stuff that's available now and is coming in the future. Because what you're doing when you're using this workflow is you're saying, 
okay, I'm over there in dev and like, you know, ideally you're also, there should be like a third line where you're like, you sync the live data back kind of frequently just so that you're not getting, again, you're not diverging too much. You don't go off into the yellow wood. Um, but you're working there in dev and everything is working good. And then when you, when you do this action of getting ready to deploy, your continuous integration action in that quality assurance space is to bring the data back and push the code up. And what that does is it lets you say, what would happen if I deployed right now? Um, and that can be as simple as does it work? That, but that could also be if I run update.php or features up or you know, do my custom script or click the two buttons I think I need to click, does my deploy actually do what I think it's going to do? And if the answer is no, then you just go back into dev and you do some more commits and make it work and then you resync again. And because that live database is gonna come back in and wipe out whatever update.php did, you just get to run that process over again. And you can do that as many times as you need to until it's bulletproof and then you can deploy. Like um, I have the Clint Eastwood picture up before. Like how many of you guys have seen the, the good, the bad and the ugly? Show of hands. So it's a, it's a little older movie, it's pretty popular. So um, the sort of one of the crucial scenes in it is like Clint Eastwood comes out and like they'd shoot him up but it turns out he's had like an iron stove plate under his parka, parka the whole time and then he wins. And this is kind of like that moment where you're like, I'm a cowboy and I'm gonna play it fast and loose except I'm totally bulletproof and nothing can kill me. Um, and that's the feeling you get from this, which is a really good feeling and I encourage you all to experience it. The tool that I like to use for this is Jenkins. Um, how many of you guys have used Jenkins? Okay, so many of you, but not all of you, I'll just show real quick. Jenkins is, a, is essentially a job running and management system that's designed for continuous integration. You can use it for a lot of other fun things too. I like using it for all sorts of cool stuff. Um, it's a Java project, so it's not like Drupal, but it's not that hard to get running and it's really well built. Like as Java projects go, Jenkins is kind of like, it's in, the a, it's in the 99th percentile of quality, in my opinion. It's a great piece of software. It's got a solid community about it. They told Oracle to go suck it and did their own thing, and it was, it was cool. So, um, oh, let's not get there yet. So, um, brief demo. So, basically, Jenkins allows you to define jobs and then lets you run them. Um, and so like you can have a job called sync database and, and that, that job can run the MySQL commands to sync the database between the environments. You can have a job called, you know, run unit tests. Well, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but if you wanted to run, if you're doing Drupal core development, you wanted to run unit tests, you could have a job in here that does that. And what it does is it keeps track of every time something was run, whether it succeeded or failed, and it gives you a log of everything that happened while it was doing it, which is great. The other thing about it is that it has a built-in REST API, so it's very easy to integrate this with your other scripted tools. Um, and you know, you have to do a little bit of work to figure out exactly how you want to do that, but you're not like, oh, I gotta invent something. It's like, here's some software, you just drop right in there and it can do it. And this is a really, really powerful tool that doesn't take much expertise to set up and it gives you an enormous amount of flexibility. And I recommend everybody who's interested in this type of workflow, just check this stuff out, because it's very, very good. There's also services you can do. There's like a Jenkins as service. There's other CI services that are coming out, because more and more people are getting on board with this stuff. But if you want to roll your own, this is the best rolling paper I can imagine. Um, <laughs> so, what about Drupal 8, right? Drupal 8 has some new stuff in it. Drupal 8 is gonna have this con configuration management initiative. Drupal 8's gonna export your configuration to code. Drupal 8 is Shangri-La. <laughs> and this man has fixed everything for us. How many of you guys know, know Greg? Um, you should, he's a really great guy, but um, if you know anything about him, you know I'm kind of like playing against his personality type because the answer is nope. Um, this is much more his vibe sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no, Greg's a really great guy. He's a friend and uh, he's a wonderful person. And if you see this man at the conference, you should thank him for all the work that he's done because CMI is a major, major, major win for Drupal. Like right now, Drupal is using a configuration idiom that was, that dates back to Drupal version one, I think. It's basically, at the time, it was revolutionary that you could even put configuration in the database and edit it through the web UI. That was like 10 years ago, and it was like, holy, wow, that's, a, that's really useful. That's amazing. And then 10 years later, we've discovered there are a lot of drawbacks to that too, and we're sort of catching up with the rest of the web in terms of using standard configuration file formats and writing this stuff out to disk so that we can version control it and deploy it, rather than having it in the same database as our content and, and having the two be muddled together. 
together. So it's a major, major, major win. I can't stress how important this is. And it's one of the best initiatives in Drupal 8 because it got in pretty early and all the other initiatives are built on it. So there's no way this isn't happening, which is great. Um, but, uh, and, and, and uses YAML, if you guys haven't seen this, I, I couldn't actually com come up with a screenshot to show you, but the, the, uh, you're gonna like it because if you like version control and you like looking at diffs to see what's changed, the, the way that this is written, how many of you guys has, have used um, like features? Yeah, so like how useful is it to look at a diff of one version of a feature module and another? Like on a scale of one to 10? Two? Sometimes it helps, but sometimes it doesn't because these, these features are mostly like, I mean, God bless Earl for doing that like C tools export stuff because nobody else did and fucking A. But, uh, <laughs> but exporting these giant PHP objects, like when you try to compare the two of them, very often it's just like a mess. Well, in, in terms of what the diff looks like, it doesn't really, it's hard to look at a diff and actually see what's going on. The CMI initiative exports to YAML and it does so in a really economical way that keeps it organized. So like when you actually look at a diff, unless there's like a huge delta of change and, and that's a problem anyway because you went too far into the yellow wood in the first place. Um, if you look at a diff and the delta isn't too huge, it's actually really easy to say, okay, this changed to that, this got added there and this name changed to that. And you're like, oh, oh I can look at a diff and understand what the config changes are even if I didn't make them. And that's really, really, really powerful. Um, but you still need a solid workflow because it's gonna still be the case that you have to like get this stuff developed, you have to check it into version control, you have to deploy it, and you have to make sure that before you deploy it, you test it. So the CMI initiative is basically gonna make this continuous integration process much, much more effective and much less painful for people, but it doesn't mean that you don't have to do it, right? It just means that it'll be cooler and better and allow you to build sites faster. Um, a word about automated testing. Um, I've been a part of a, a, like some pretty big Drupal builds in my consulting days, and I've seen organizations spend six figures writing simple tests that never found anything. Um, and it's because the, the core simple test unit testing framework is really meant for core development. Um, and that's where it really provides an enormous amount of value and Drupal 8 wouldn't be possible without it and it's, it's totally good. But when you're building a custom bespoke website for a, a client, the unit testing, it's you're sort of coming at it from the wrong angle, right? What you need is much more of a kind of a functional test and the good news is that better testing for site builders is coming. Right? We're sort of in this middle ground now between pure tester and development or unit tester and development and we're moving towards behavior driven development. Behavior driven development are, is a is sort of a new set of idioms and, and tools that are designed around expressing like here's what should happen when this happens in a kind of a high level way not when I load a node it has this variable because that very rarely breaks when you're just building um, a site and you're trying to do a custom menu callback but behavior driven development is a much better idiom for testing the functionality of a website and eventually we'll get into accepted tester development and when that happens we'll, we'll reach Shangri-La maybe. Um, and uh, the, the tool that is kind of becoming like the, the PHP tool that's becoming the leader for this is called Behat. Um, there's been a, some work done already to integrate Drupal with Behat. I recommend that everybody sort of try to get, get hip to this because it's not like was well, the stuff I showed you before like a git deploy hook or a Jenkins. Those are like settled questions right in my opinion. You should use Jenkins. It's not really like don't don't spend a lot of time evaluating different systems. Just use Jenkins and it'll work great and you'll be set. Use Git, it'll work great, you'll be set. Behat is looking like the winner in this space, but the right way to use it with Drupal and the proper integration paths and how best to use it as a site builder are still unsettled questions that we need everybody to kind of think about and experiment with and help the community work together on discovering the best practices for. Um, and so if you're into this kind of stuff, get hip to Behat because it's gonna be a big deal, I think. Um, Last little points here on the, on the yellow wood. Um, uh, keep your development environment fresh. I mentioned this before. Um, in order to make this really work well, you should just have scripts for this. Like uh, you use Git for everything and you script everything. Make it automated, make it testable, make it like just a brain dead science where you don't have to think about where things are. Just run a script, freshen your, your dev environment. And if you can save 25 minutes a day by scripting something, that's a person day a month. And if you have a team of six or eight people, then you're saving a person week a month. So it's really, really worth investing in some of this, these automation systems because they reduce error and they essentially sit, they, they, in, and they improve your time. They get people out of doing robotic automated things that frankly people are not good at because we're creative thinkers and we like to analyze patterns and solve problems. But computers, they rule at like doing the same thing over and over again and we should use them for that. Um, 
I want to, so the two pieces in here, tricks. Data has mass, so if you have a lot of content in your site, this can be a challenge and you should kind of think creatively about how to approach the challenge. One simple trick that I recommend everybody think about if you're writing scripts for doing your data synchronization is break up your MySQL sync into two steps. One that dumps the schema of the whole database and then one that dumps the tables but skips the ones you really don't need to sync like the watchdog, the access log, any cache tables, other stuff like that. That can actually cut down the time it takes to sync a big database by five to ten minutes. And again, you save five minutes here, you save ten minutes there, suddenly you've got another person week at the end of the month and your team can do more awesome things. Um, Drush aliases, this is another thing. Uh, when you're like working in a production environment or a dev environment, very often like at some point you won't have shell access um, or you won't be able to get shell access, but you should still be able to get Drush access if you set things up correctly. And how many of you have used Drush aliases? Okay, so basically, I don't, have, I don't need to tell you guys how this works, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip that because I think I'm running a little long here. Um, but this is super important, and it's part of keeping your swagger. It's part of staying on, you know, on point, and there's no reason not to do it. If you want to figure out how to do this, come talk to me afterwards. Um, all right, deployment, right? This is just a simple few notes about deploying. Um, when you deploy to production, um, there are people who have strong opinions about whether you should be pushing things out with rsync or triggering jobs to, to, to pull data from another Chronicle source. And, you know, there's kind of like some religious discussions about what the right tool is this. Should you use Capistrano? Should you, can you use Jenkins? Should you roll your own scripts? Et cetera, et cetera. Push, pull, script method A, Python, Ruby, whatever it is, as long as it's automated, and as long as it works the same way every time, and as long as it gets all your code out to wherever it needs to be, like if you have multiple production environments, you gotta make sure that the code arrives. Within 30 seconds or so, you're doing okay. And, and you'll, you'll probably be all right. And the, the thing is not to get hung up on like a, a million little details. The thing is to make sure you hit this minimum bar for deployment, because if you're, ever, if you're still doing deployment by hand, that's the bigger problem, because eventually by hand is going to fail, and then you're back in like the fear zone and everything falls apart. Um, ideally, you integrate this with version control. I'll show you a little quick example, and then you script, test, and automate. So if I were going to integrate something with version control, I might take this, and I might say git tag, this is the commit that I just made, um, deploy 99, git push origin tags. So this is going to go ahead and push out to, um, to, to my production environment, and, uh, and it's you know, going to do it live for us. And uh, what I have it here is just, I, I, the, this would be the API call that I would have made, and it would have gone something like this, deploy 99. And we can watch it happen. It's already done. It checked it out. This is like my live environment, and here we see it's the same thing that I deployed before. And again, all I'm doing with this is still using, I'm still using the post receive hook for this. Um, I just scrolled down here to hide it from before. And I'm just looking for the keyword deploy in the tag. Again, you can get much more sophisticated and baroque with this if you want to use a different mechanism for doing deployments. I like tagging for deployment personally, because tags are like individual atomic units. Um, I don't like doing a branch for deployment because sometimes the branch gets an update and, and if for some reason it doesn't deploy for some reason, it's very, it can become tricky to know what got deployed and what didn't. Whereas tags, it's always abundantly clear what the latest deploy tag was and what's in that. And if you need to go back to another tag, it's pretty easy to figure out which is which. And so this is just saying, okay, look for the deploy tag and if so, run our do it live script. And in this case, I sort of give an example of how you might rig that through Jenkins. Um, if I'd had another hour last night, I could have made that curl do that for me rather than having me copy and paste it for instance. Um, so investing in automation is essential, right? This is sort of the, the mantra of this whole thing. Like if you're doing these production environments, the, the configuration of the production environments should be automated. There are a lot of hard things about running big production environments that I, I don't want to get into too much here because that's not the substance of this talk, but like 
you know, how do you make sure that everybody's got the same MySQL configuration settings? How do you make sure your network file system is mounted correctly? How do you make sure that you got to automate all of that? Because if you're doing it by hand, like that's human failure happens way too often. And it's nobody's fault. It's just what people are, that we're not good at doing the same thing over and over and over again and never screwing up. That's just not how we work. So investing in automation is essential. You need to build the Borg yourself, right? You should strive to have this level of um, unstoppable gla galaxy conquering automation at, in, your, uh, in, your, in your infrastructure and your workflows. Um, and the, the end point of this is that sites that are backed by automated systems that give you the ability to do all this stuff without having to do a bunch of manual work or remember things are going to be better. They're going to be better websites because they're going to be able to continue to evolve after they're launched. They're going to be able to respond to what users demand and they're just going to kind of lead the pack. They're going to win, right? If two sites get launched at the same, around the same time and one of them launches and stays the same for two years and the other one launches and continues to iterate and evolve and respond and improve, this second site is going to be the better website at the end of the day. And we all want to build the best website we can. We all want to help our customers. We all want to help our organizations. We all want to be proud of our work. And having these tools in place lets us keep our developer swagger and continue to do that. And you know, you'll have this breakaway effect where you know, some people are like get, getting up at the front of the pack and they're, they're out and they're leading and they're, you know, if you've ever watched cycling races, it usually happens and there's this huge separation that occurs. Um, and the good news is that you don't have to do this all on your own. Um, there's a huge amount of open source development work in this space. I've, you know, I've showed you a few tools. There are many more. Um, there are whole conferences devoted to this, this discipline that are full of interesting and exciting people. There are also services out there that can help you do this. There's, there's services for CI. There's services for like Drupal specific hosting that does this workflow for you. There are services that help you just run Jenkins. There is GitHub, which can help you get started with Git and give you the tools to do a lot of this stuff without having to write so many shell scripts. And you don't have to do it all on your own, right? You don't have to like own everything yourself, but you should really be thinking about how you're going to embrace this new paradigm of building kick-ass websites and keeping it rocking even after the launch goes out. And that is the end of my talk, and I'm happy to take your questions. Um, there's a microphone back there, so if you guys do have questions, go ahead and line up. You can ask me anything. You ask me what my favorite module is. Ask me like what I, how, how late I set up last night. Whatever you want to do. I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, obviously, designers and coders and project managers and everything have different skill sets. Yeah. Uh, often, I've struggled to identify ways to get some consistency around designers using Git or Jenkins. Thank you. Uh, do you have any recommendations for how to, to standardize on that and how to get people up to speed and do uh, with diver, uh, diverse skill sets? Um, that, that's a really good question. And the, the thing is that, again, because this is an emerging discipline, you know, a lot of this is still not super easy. Um, and uh, some of it, you know, requires uh, skills that are outside maybe what someone's wheelhouse is. Um, I think that there are better and better desktop tools for using Git. Um, they're, they're, the, the open source ones really aren't as good as the ones that cost 40 or $50 a pop, but they're potentially worth it. And most of them have demos and trials. So I'd like, if you're a Mac user, I would look at Git Tower um, is a pretty good one. Um, they're, uh, uh, if you want to use my service, I've got a way for you to like use FTP and still use Git at the same time, and they'll demo that for you on the trade floor. But basically there are, uh, you know, you can, you can find ways to integrate these things that let people still use a lot of the tools that they're familiar with. For designers, let them use a, 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 some, one of their uh, IDEs like Dreamweaver or whatever that's based on an FTP protocol type workflow, or at least give them a Git GUI so that when they're working in their local development environment, they can make, easily see what's changed, commit it, and, and push it. And then it's just a matter, uh, beyond that point, of having having the steps down and being very clear. And automation will help you do this because when you've automated, you're doing it the same way every time. And, and hopefully, if you are mindful of the developer experience while you're automating, you can get things to be as uh, straightforward as possible. So that like, if, it's, if it's the same three steps each time and you can like, write it on a laminated index card and put it on someone's desk, then that, that's really good. Um, so I think you know, those, those are general answers. Unfortunately, there aren't like 
there aren't, that's not a settled question because this is an evolving space, but basically what you want to do is look at, try to, try to find ways to let people use the tools they already know and love and integrate with this stuff. Um, for instance, also GitHub lets you, I don't know if you guys have, if you've seen this, on GitHub you can go in and actually use their web interface to edit a file and turn that into a commit if you want. That's kind of cool. And there's more stuff that's going to come out like that that will integrate better with these tools. And so I kind of keep up with that and, and you know, see what, see what you can see. Um, yes. Hi, Josh. Hey, Bevan. Um, are your slides going to be available online? Uh, yes, I will post them uh, right after this. Cool. Um, what do you think of using Drush Make to get and update Drupal core and Contra modules as opposed to checking them in? So I am uh, really interested in how we can better integrate Drush Make with a Git-centric workflow because I think that um, you know, there are, there, this, is, this is another place where people have like interesting debates, right? There, there are a lot of services now that really are based on kind of building tarballs to deploy or other things like that. It's, and it's sort of like a, it's more of a Java-ish deployment mechanism where you're, you know, you're throwing out this, this, uh, this zipped archive and throwing it on the web. Um, and DrushMake kind of by default wants to do that. There are ways to make DrushMake pull the core from a Git upstream. Um, and there are probably ways to integrate that. I've been kind of experimenting with ways to make it so that you can do, you know, start with a Drush Make file and then, you know, upload a new Drush Make file and then see the diff in Git of what was actually changed so you can approve that, turn that into a commit because the thing that's critical is that each step along the way as you are developing is versioned. Um, and while you can version the Drush Make file, unless you're a very, very specific and particular Drush Make developer and you specify the exact version of every module you want to use, it's very easy to end up with a Drush Make file that just referenced like views and then you know you you build that one month and then you deploy it again three months later, you got a different view, version of views and it, and it breaks. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of interested in figuring out how to like it'll implement Drush Make which is very good for Drupal uh, distribution development and product development without kind of Letting it, without allowing that kind of, oh, whoops, I, did, I wasn't super specific about everything and now I've got a broken build kind of process. Cool. Yeah. Um, do you think having a, um, a Git hook implementation on, on sandboxes that runs Drush Make every time you pull um, is, is a useful step to help facilitate that? Yeah, that that could totally work. Like what you what you really want is um, like you're you're pushing up a Drush Make file. It's doing the Drush Make, and then you're able to kind of examine the diff between them. And if you like the looks of the diff and the site works as expected, you could turn that into a commit. And then if you need to deploy that out, because like literally you could run into a situation where in your development environment it looks good, but if it's just running Drush Make everywhere, like the next hour when you deployed it to prod, one of the versions of the modules could have changed in a way that breaks the site. That's unlikely, but it's actually possible. So what I'd like to be able to do is have Drush Make be integrated with Git as a development process, but still use version control and tagging as a mechanism for doing testing and deployment, because that way you know that it's never going to change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, finally, um, I, I, I use Pantheon. I think it's fantastic. Thank you for, for um, being a part of making it. Oh, thank you very um, much. And for the people here that don't use it or are not familiar with it, I think it'd be really useful if you did plug it a little bit and just explain which part of this whole process it, it fits into and which parts it offers and doesn't offer. Uh, well, if people want to stick around after the questions, I'll do a short, short demo. But I, I'm not here to, I'm, I'm here to talk about this stuff, not just to promote Pantheon. Um, yes? Hey, uh, I'm Mike, and uh, thanks for your talk. It was uh, really affirming of some of the things that we have as part of our development group and the processes that we have. One thing that um, we do is with GitHub, or specifically in our case, Bitbucket. Sure, um, that's another have, great service. I should have mentioned them before, we, too. We um, have... Uh, post commit hooks which are very similar sort of to the hooks that you uh, put in with the project that you did an example of and I was wondering if there were differences because I because I use these post hooks that um, are part of Bitbucket I didn't know if there were differences with putting the file within the project like you had and doing it that way versus the other way. So the, the way that this works, and I'm not as familiar with Bitbucket as I am with GitHub, <clears throat> so feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but the way that the, the, when you have a hosted Git service, typically they're not let, they don't want, they don't want you to uh, check in a post commit hook because that could run whatever arbitrary shell stuff on their service and from a security standpoint, they're not interested in dealing with that. 
But what they will allow you to do is say, I've got something that's listening for a REST call. Usually, it's, most people are doing this with REST these days. And after I push to Bitbucket or to GitHub, um, you will ping out to whatever I tell you to with the metadata. And you can actually set Jenkins up to listen for those sorts of things um, if you want to run your own steps after that. And that's how all the services that are out there, like Circle CI or Worker or uh, these other ones that are they're kind of trying to build CI as a, as a cloud service to integrate with those things, that's how they all work. They're like, copy and paste this URL into your project. Project, and what's happening is you're pushing to Bitbucket. Bitbucket's like, okay, I got your code. I'm going to ping out to your service, and then that service is, or your Jenkins instance. That service could be a service that you bought, or it could be something that you built. It's basically taking that and saying, okay, let me pull from the the, the Bitbucket now, so I have the code, and then potentially do other things if necessary. And and it really does get us into this place of where we're kind of building network distributed systems, which is. Which is fun and exciting to me. I don't know. It's complicated, but I like it. So yeah, it's and it sounds like that's the way you know we're kind of handling things. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing some sort of advantage to checking in the post commit, like you or or having that as part of your project. Like you yeah, no, no. What I uh, what I was demonstrating was just if you want to roll your own Git server, that's how you might gotcha. do it because you don't have to worry about the security of your the own scripts sure. you're writing, and it's actually more work to like build your own thing that's calling out to REST. Okay. Um, Thank you. Sure. Yes. Um, I don't know if this is too specific of a question, but how does the how does committing to the get bear repo workflow differ from like rebasing to just like a test site? Like so, uh, no, that's this is a good question. So. Um, they're not necessarily, uh, they're sort of orthogonal. Like the, the bare repository is something, again, if you don't want to use Bitbucket or GitHub or another service and you want to run your own Git server and you want to be able to push code to that server and then if you want basically want to be able to push to your own server, you need to run it as a bare repo and that's just a coordination point. Like I'll, sh I'll show you real quick. Um, in the bare repo, um, which is, oops, turn off caps lock, which is where I am right now. Um, it's not like you don't see the, the checkout or anything else. It's like the inside of the got, di, dot get metadata directory. The bare repo is not something you could point a web browser at or run code out of. It's really just something that's able to receive incoming packs from Git perform action and then perform actions and then and then you can pull from it later so in the test instance like for in, if, if I if I had set up a, a, a testing example where you know you create a test dash something tag right then the bare repo could say oh I detected a test tag let's go you know rebase or reset hard the test environment and then maybe kick something off that does automated testing or just send an email to the group saying go look at it right now or whatever um, but that's just the bare repo the way to think of the bare repo is that it's a a coordinating mechanism. Um, it's and, and it's and Git distinguishes between this is a, there's bare repos and working repos. Working repos actually have all the files and the code in them. Bare repos are just pure metadata for coordination. So essentially, like if you have GitHub or Bitbucket, it would replace the bare repo in yes. the workflow. Yes, exactly. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure. I, uh, I was just wondering if you ever tried Fing along with uh, Jenkins. Say what? What is it? Fing. Thing? Yeah, it, it's pretty much Ant for PHP. Ah, no, I haven't. Um, I've tried Ant with Java, and it, I felt like it was like it was not the best experience for me, just because it's complicated, <laughs> and I felt like I was joining a fraternity or something. But uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, there's Jenkins. The, 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 I didn't mention this before. I didn't go too deep into Jenkins. Jenkins is so it has a great plugin ecosystem too. Kind of like Drupal has modules, Jenkins has plugins, and so there's Thing. Is that yeah. yeah? So this is like a probably a, a a bigger build management system for PHP projects. And if you're, my guess is that in the future, Symphony, Thing, maybe those things work well together. Uh, but I I don't have any experience with that personally. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, two things. Are are there any good uh, documentation or tutorials on setting up Jenkins uh, like locally to test with, and then deploying maybe Jenkins to a server? Sure. So. Um, Setting it up locally, you will need, I, I would not try to do it unless you have a Linux box or a Linux virtual machine at least. And then if you're doing that, it shouldn't be really different than setting up on a server, right? There, I think you probably can get it work together. There might be a brew recipe for it, but it's very much like a, a Linux E project. And I, I would not, uh, I would say you're better off just getting the right op operating system to run it than trying to 
deal with the eccentricities of running it under Mac OS or on Windows. Um, but there is really good, uh, really good documentation on the Jenkins-CI.org website. They have a wiki that has recipes for doing pretty much anything you would want to do to get it rolling, um, including you know, securing it for production use and other things like that. They maintain packages for, the, for Ubuntu and Red Hat and everything else. You basically just in install Java, install Jenkins, you know, open up the port that you want to work on and go at that point. And then, you know, you, you, you like, like with anything, you get more and more and more sophisticated over time. But the zero to Jenkins should take about 10 to 20 minutes. Thanks. Sure. And the second thing is, uh, for those of us who aren't familiar with Josh Aliases, could you run through your fake demo real quick? Sure, I will totally do that. Thanks. Hi, thanks a lot. That was an awesome talk. Thank you. Um, I um, I have to be 90% billable, and our company doesn't have a tools budget. Right. What metrics do I start tracking in my 10% of the time to demonstrate empirically that this is something that must happen? <laughs> well, no, but they're 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 not they free in developed. terms of your time. Yeah. Right. That's that. That's the secret cost of open source is that you get older while you use it. Uh, <laughs> as I'm beginning to learn, oh, I'll have to remember that. That joke killed. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the things that I would track are um, uh, quantitatively. You're going to need, you, I, I'm not quite sure how sophisticated you are in tracking uh, like developer productivity in general, but quantitatively you're going to want to like get a handle on, um, start to, uh, so if, if you, if, if your 10% time includes some like management of a team, is that correct or? Uh, no, it's, that's for like answering emails. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so I would try to find 1% of your time to just start surveying yourself and your colleagues on a weekly basis about like how many hours did you spend because you got hung up somewhere, right? And that should allow you to demonstrate to your management at some point that you know we're spinning. Basically, the whole the whole the the, the argument for management is um, any time that you spent. What did you do this week that wasn't like really working on the website? Like, did you have to like try to un, un mess up MySQL? Did you have to like spend an hour getting a fresh deep database dump? Did you have to like you know, waste a whole day because you had to reset up the project or so forth. And just start, those things don't necessarily happen every day, but st start keeping track of them and just like get on, on like a notepad how many hours it was. And my guess is that over the course of a month, you could then go to your boss and say, look, and if you're, you work for a, a professional services consultancy, right? So yeah, I, I, I used to run chapter three and um, we would account for this. And it's like, the, it's the time where, you know, everybody wants their workers to be 90% billable, but that's really hard to hold up to. Right, and you always end up discounting some hours because you're like, well, you know, we were working on your site. We weren't really working on your site, if you know what I mean. Um, and if you just start to add up those hours on your end, show them to your boss, and you say, look, this is something. This is something we can improve. And developer efficiency um, and the time it takes to um, get your work done goes directly to the bottom line of that organization. Um, that's also a reason to look at getting it as a service, um, uh, not not to to toot my own horn, but I I the problem the downside of a lot of this is that if you don't have a large enough organization to actually devote the time to maintaining this, you should think through the build versus buy decision because it may be that the buy decision, if the cost is good, is a better one for your organization than the build decision, but. I think it's important to really know what it takes to build and, and really consider it for yourself. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Um, I'll show you guys Drush aliases real quick. And then I'll show you a little Pantheon if you want to see. Um, so, Drush. I've got Drush on my laptop. Drush has aliases. And what aliases are are ways of pointing Drush at a remote server, a remote installation of a site. Um, so just like you run Drush like inside the, 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 the main code directory of a site that you want to do some Drush work on, you can uh, set Drush up to essentially be aware of a remote um, alias and run things there. So for instance, I have the aliases in, on my laptop for the Pantheon public www website. So I can do like Drush at this um, status. 
and it's going to go, you know, basically you have to have SSH to, to make this work. You have to have some kind of SSH channel. But then it can go and find on Pantheon or wherever you're hosting this what's going on with Thrush. Okay, so it's up to date Drupal core. You know, there's MySQL, et cetera, and you can see the, the admin theme and so forth. And if you wanted to do like Drush, um, you know, WS, it like shows you the latest watchdog entries. This can be very useful for doing certain sorts of things, right? Um, and you can, you can clear the caches, and you can do anything else. I, I really encourage like the use of Drush um, as you build, especially if you build complex projects where there's ever anything you wanna do, like a data migration or an import or export or something has to sync with a remote service, really think about building that stuff through Drush and not through like a, something that runs in a web browser, because anything that could take a long time, you're much better off building it on Drush than trying to connect it to a user clicking something. Um, it's just way more bulletproof. Does, and I'll show you real quick the anatomy of one of these files. So in order to use this, you just have a dot drush directory, and then you have something in there. This was from Pantheon, but it's really anything dot aliases dot dot php in your dot drush directory in your home will be ready to pick up. And all that is is you know it's it's a PHP file and it spits out an array, right? So you get an array of aliases. There's a doc root, uh, a URL, the database URL, and you can actually put a bunch more config options in here if there are certain things that you, you, you want to actually have. Every time you use Drush, you know, there's certain things you can specify on the command line. The Drush alias file you can use actually locally if you just have a lot of command line arguments you don't want to have to retype over and over again. And this is just a convenience method for using Drush effectively that allows you to use it against remote hosts. And in our case, we make it possible for you to use it against dev, test, or live because that way, you know, you can, act, it's a great way to be able to still get your work done even though you don't have shell access to the live environment, for instance. Uh, real credentials? Uh, eh, you can't see the password. Because um, this is a, uh, uh, oh yeah, you can. I'll have to go change that. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely not. <laughs> uh, we'll have to migrate those. Hey, uh, well, this gives me a great chance to, you guys want to see, like, I don't want to do, like, a Pantheon product demo, because seriously, you just go by the booth, and those guys kill it at that, and I don't want to steal their thunder. But I can show you something that they won't show you at the booth, um, which is what I would do if that happened, right? So, V3. Uh, Man, a lot of people just added sites. Um, so this is the uh, God Mode Pantheon, and uh, we got a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes with this thing. It's pretty awesome. Super stoked to be working on it and building it. So I'm just going to go over here, and I'm going to migrate these data servers. And this one too, because you can see that. And all this is like the things we got, this is, I'm not even gonna try to explain all this, but it's, it's like a, a lot of really interesting stuff. And so what's happening here is the, uh, the database server is getting uh, replicated and we'll, there's this mutiny flag we have and it's like kind of a clever joke where the new database gets created and it has the mutiny flag and then once it's ready, it like goes and destroys its master um, and then takes over. And so what that's gonna do is give it, put it on a different host and actually give it a different username and password. So I'm secure. Uh, <laughs> But Pantheon is a, is, a, is a tool that's designed to do all this stuff for you, basically. I, I, the presentation is based on my experience as a consultant building this kind of stuff as a one-off for some big organizations, and it's like a six-figure project sometimes, and doing that a few times over, and then we started Pantheon to turn that into a service, so we got a little bit more tight about some of the stuff that we do. And we do a lot of other interesting things at Pantheon because we run this at scale. We have you know, tens of thousands of sites and you know, 1,500 to 2,000 developers logging in and using this every week. So you can't just have everybody load their, it's not just, oh, give them SSH access. We have to kind of get clever about, about a bunch of things um, when you run at that scale. But it basically gives you that dev, test, and live workflow, you can sync stuff, you can move things through, there's an error log if you need it, etc. Um, and uh, um, if you want to see like the overall demo of how things work, I really, uh, I really recommend checking it out uh, at the booth because those guys give a really nice demo and there's other people, you can talk to me afterwards if you want, but I wanted to show the under the hood stuff. Um, thanks for coming, if you guys have any other questions, just step right up, otherwise I will see you all around the conference. Thank <laughs> you.